Thanks very much for joining us this morning. I'm Steve McMenamin. I'm your host for today's event, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our topic this morning, contemporary perspectives on investment policy, will hopefully uh, shape up to be a modern classic. Uh, there's not much I can say except that we've managed to persuade two legends to join us today. Uh, and as always, the views of our speaker are their own and don't represent the view of the roundtable, its staff, or our trustees. Charlie Ellis literally wrote the book on the subject. Uh, first came winning the loser's game, uh, and then came investment policy. Uh, he's the chairman of the Yale Endowment uh, Investment Committee and a passionate advocate for investor education. Peter Bernstein has written many books, all of them outstanding. Uh, his contributions to the profession speak for themselves. Uh, Peter continues to blaze trails in uncharted territories, and we're grateful he shows no signs of throttling back. Uh, Ted Seides is the moderator of the roundtable today. Ted runs the investments for protege partners after spending some time in the Yale Investment Office. Please welcome Ted as he sets the table. Thanks, Steve. Uh, this morning is particularly fun and, and personally rewarding for me. I have known Charlie and Peter literally my entire professional career. Uh, we share a very deep admiration and intimate knowledge for the Yale Endowment, which, as you know, is the institution generally synonymous with the modern application of investment policy. Outside of Dave Swenson, I don't think there are two more prominent people in our community that know more about the inner workings of the Yale Endowment. <clears throat> Charlie served on the Investment Committee for know, probably two decades and has chaired it for over one. What's less well known is he was the motivating force behind David Swenson writing his first book that among other things <clears throat> grew David's name to become from David Swenson to the aura of Dave Swenson. Uh, What's even less well known is Charlie is an important factor in why I am here today. About, I guess a little over 10 years ago, Charlie found out I had been put on the wait list at Harvard Business School. And in a way that only Charlie could say, he approached me with words I don't think I'll ever forget, which, is, which was, send me your essays, this week better than next week, today better than tomorrow, this morning better than this afternoon. And within a week, I was admitted to Harvard. So it is indeed with deep respect and indebtedness that I listen to his words today. To the extent that the Greenwich Roundtable seeks to revive the lost art of investment storytelling, I think Charlie probably created it. He is indeed a master storyteller. And additionally, if you've ever spoken to him in person, you know that he has the innate ability to make you feel like you're the only important person, sorry, that you're the most important person in the room. And that's true even if Warren Buffett and Ben Graham himself were standing behind Charlie at the time. I heard about Peter Bernstein probably a little over 15 years ago from a guy named Peter Brodsky, who at the time was a close friend of mine from college and happens to be Peter's grandson. Soon thereafter, I was introduced to him professionally by Dave Swenson when I saw an off-white colored piece of paper called Economics and Portfolio Strategy on, on David's desk, to which he said, yes, this was written by a very smart man, which were pretty important words when you're 21 years old. Uh, in the midst of Peter's prolific book writing, in 2003, he wrote a piece in that very newsletter entitled, Are Policy Portfolios Obsolete? Now, next to the words subprime mortgage, the words market timing are probably the most blasphemous in Dave Swenson's view of institutional investing. And I'm sure we'll get into today some of the premises uh, from which Peter evolved the thesis that questioned the, the success of policy port port portfolios going forward in, a, in an era of low expected returns. <clears throat> If you haven't read his newest book, Capital Ideas Evolving, I would strongly suggest you pick it up. And in particular, the chapter he wrote on the Yale Endowment is probably the most insightful words I've ever seen in print getting to the next layer of understanding of how Yale executes its investments. For all of Peter's accomplishments and his brilliance, 
What I have long most admired about him is his genuine warmth and humility as, as a person. He is indeed a wonderful man. Charlie, want to lead us off? Sure. Uh, I'd like to start with a confession. Peter Bernstein and I are both deeply in love with the same woman, his wife. <laughs> and you will understand when you get to see how charming a person he is that I've never introduced him to my wife and I don't intend to. Uh, we're supposed to be in strong disagreement, so I'd like to slip in a little bit of agreement before we get into serious altercation. First, a strategic portfolio with rigorous rebalancing on a systematic basis is a truly great idea. The reason it's a great idea is it obliges those who would be the investor or their committee representatives to do some very serious thinking in depth about investing and investments, about long-term experiences in capital markets, as disagreeable as they sometimes can be, Long-term thinking about institutional or individual priorities, what do you really, really care about and why? And what is the mission of the money? That's terrifically important. Any great rule should have some exceptions that prove the rule, and the exceptions are that deviations, rare and rigorously developed, deviations do pay off. Now, there are some who have misunderstood Peter really quite profoundly who would suggest that Yale doesn't believe in this sort of thing. Uh, we've done a little bit of a statistical analysis to find out whether we believe in it really or not, and we find that we've been able to add something over 1% per year compounded by doing minor, rigorous deviations which would prove, for those of you who are interested in a more social interpretation, that a small amount of sin is considered a good thing. The second thing that I hope we can agree on is that Peter is a great American and a profound thinker, but even he can be misrepresented. And I find myself increasingly exposed to misunderstandings and misrepresentations of what's taking place at Yale, particularly when the home team put up a score of 28 and left it for anybody else to try to make a mark beside it. Now, you may not have thought about it quite this way, but I would like you to at least give a moment's thought to the possibility that David Swenson now has the worst and most difficult job in the investment profession, maybe ever, certainly currently. Because there ain't nobody who's going to repeat something like that, even my friend David. Now, in the markets as a whole, I think we would all agree that complexity is rising at a spectacular rate. And of course, this creates opportunity, but it also creates a substantially more rapid increase in difficulty. So as they used to say on Hill Street Blues, which for many years was my son's and my favorite TV show, be careful out there. Now, there are two groups of people that I think should get some of our attention. One I'll be relatively brief on, but I have a tear stained view. Retirement security was one of the greatest ideas of the post-Second World War era in this country, and it was wonderfully well developed with pension funds. Didn't make any difference how long you lived. It didn't make any difference how much you paid attention to investing. It didn't make any difference how much you understood investing. You were going to be okay. Now, we've switched and are switching and will continue to switch at a very rapid rate from defined benefit to defined contribution. And with that, we have got some characteristics that anyone who's involved and interested in investing should be concerned about. But those of us who are talking today about investment policy need to be sure we understand. A third of the people who are covered with defined contribution plans either do not participate at all or participate at such a low level that they will be for sure on a freight train to poverty in their elder years long after it's too late for them to do anything about it. The fault, dear lady, lies within ourselves. Uh, we made the mistake as a people because the Department of Labor and the SEC could not coordinate their thinking and could not coordinate their regulations. And as a result, lawyers advise their corporate clients, don't tell anybody nothing. And therefore, large numbers of people, when sitting down with HR to get their new job, are told, if you want to, you can participate in this defined contribution plan. Well, can you tell me whether I should or not? No. 
If I did, can you tell me how I should? No. That is finally changing, but the remediation will be a very long and slow and difficult process. A quarter of the people, and there's some duplication and overlap here, so be careful of the Venn diagram. A quarter of the people participating in defined contribution plans invest in a dreadfully wrong way. Most of them invest in a wrong way by putting everything in a money market fund. After all, when they first started, it was a savings account, not an investment account, and they never changed anything because nobody ever changes anything in defined contribution plans. <clears throat> The second thing is that out of loyalty to their company, the company I know best, their employer, they plunk down most of the money in the employer's stock. And that, of course, is a double indemnity of considerable personal risk. So if you wanted to say that there was a policy being set by individual investors with regard to their retirement security, I guess you could say it was policy, but it's really dreadfully wrong. Uh, Second group that I think we ought to be paying attention to, because it's so darn interesting to watch, are the endowment funds of this country. Uh, when Bob Barker sat down to lead his committee for the Ford Foundation in the study of endowments, they found that nobody was measuring investment results and very heavy investment commitments to fixed income and to boring equities. And they railed against it and said you should invest for growth because your institution is going to be around for a long time and you should be very careful about how much you would invest in fixed interest. It took 25 years for that clarion call to be really converted into pragmatic practice. But today you have a small group maybe a dozen institutions that are way out in front on that proposition. They've rung the debt portion of their portfolios down to somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. And at that level, it does contribute to the overall financial management of an institution and therefore serves quite well. They have then distributed the equity investments around the world, and they've moved out of listed securities into unlisted investments of an equity characteristic with abandon or with vigor. I delete the word abandon because it is with vigor. It's very deliberate. Uh, and this commitment has been then picked up by a group of intermediaries known as Cambridge Associates and spread around to other endowments and then picked up by Frank Russell and some of the other major consulting firms serving the corporate market and spread increasingly to the corporate market. This is the way to go. I've just come back from a trip truly around the world, went through Denmark and New Zealand along the way and stopped off in six different places to work with large pools of capital, in most cases government-sponsored. And what everybody wants to talk about everywhere I went is the endowment paradigm, which very quickly becomes, what are you guys at Yale doing and which managers have you chosen and who could I tag along with you to choose also? And the extraordinary commitment to that kind of a decision-making has got to be accepted as something to do with investment policy. The amount of understanding of how difficult it is to get decent results if you're not in the top quartile in selecting those different kinds of highly specialized, wonderfully skillful, but very hard to understand investment managers is very, very modest. And it is daunting when you think how many pools of capital have got commitments to doing something that they really don't understand and are not likely to gain the understanding to do. Now, if you're in the business of managing assets and sales is your game, this is all actually very good news. Everybody likes an innocent customer. But if you're looking at it from a broader point of view, from a profession, I think you can ask some serious question, is it really what we want to be doing? I put it to you, there are four different levels of activity that we all ought to be paying attention to. The first, and far and away the most important, is to understand the true purpose of the assets that we're talking about investing. And it's particularly true if they're your assets or your family's assets. But if it's your college or it's your hospital or your museum, the same thing applies. What is the real purpose of that money is the single most important objective. And understanding it is the most object important part of the committee's work. The second most important thing is to get the structured portfolio, the strategic portfolio, in place so that you really understand what it is you're trying to accomplish and how you are going to be able to accomplish it on a realistic basis. The third objective is to do no serious harm. Don't do nothing wrong. The fourth objective, and notice it is the fourth objective, 
is getting a better rate of return than the other folks. The better rate of return than the other folks has gotten way too much of time and attention, and it is leading people away from focusing on what they really ought to focus on. Uh, so I would like to put it to you that one of the best things that's ever been done is to stimulate Peter to come here this morning and to rail against this simple proposition that I have been told I had to speak first so he could have a field day showing me where I was wrong. <laughs> I couldn't ask for a more wonderful person to tear me apart. Have fun, Peter. Well, I'm going to have a lot of fun because I was told we were going to talk about investment policy, and I didn't know that meant policy portfolio. So I prepared quite a different talk, which I'm inclined to put aside. I might pick bits and pieces from it because I would like to address some of the questions that Charlie raised. But who can disagree with 95 percent of what he said? I'm with him all the way. Um, I'd like to begin with just a, a, a joke because I thought this was so funny. I read it the other night, and it, you, you'll all understand it. Um, I read a book called The Lady Upstairs, which is not as salacious as it sounds. It's a, a biography of Dorothy Schiff, who was a Kuhn Loeb Schiff, and for many years was the owner of the New York Evening Post. Anyway, um, her, her brother ran Kuhn Loeb after her, her grandfather died, uh, Jacob Schiff. And um, somebody came there and, and was asking questions about the place and said to someone, how many people work at Kuhn Loeb? And the answer was about half. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that not true of us. We work double for, for each of us. Um, l let me state this case that suddenly the, the brainstorm that I had back then and see where it fits. David has certainly been the most uh, intense and uh, antagonist toward it, and you couldn't ask for a tougher, tougher combatant until you get to Charlie, who is even more emphatic about it. Um, I s said that the, the notion of a policy portfolio is a really, if, if you do, you're doing what you really say, um, is that this is where I want to be over the long run. Uh, don't care so much about what happens in the short run, but in the long run, this is where I want to be. And um, in the long run, the kind of the obvious answer to this is that uh, you want to be equity oriented because in the long run, the bond market, you don't know where it will go, and so equities are the place to be. Now, that doesn't mean you just go out and buy the S&P 500, but because diversification matters, particularly when you're putting all your money in the risky asset. But that this is where I want to be, and this is my policy portfolio. Um, to the greatest practical extent, exposure to equities in whatever form I can find them. And then within that, look, look for the best, rate of, best uh, trade off between risk and return. Uh, I, my, my response to this is that the words the long run bother me. Uh, I've lived long enough to see so many surprises come along that understanding what you really mean by the long run is a lot more complicated than it sounds when you say it, uh, that there's a certain amount of incantation about the long run. Yes, it is true that in the past, equities have provided the highest rate of return, and the, if you look back over the long run of the past, the answer is, is pretty obvious. There's also uh, the kind of normative question that if equities are not the best place to be in the long run, we have a lot to worry about. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a lot to worry about. We, do, we don't know. The theme of the speech that I am not giving about risk is that the essence of it, risk means that we don't know what's going to happen. And we, we all know that and we mouth it, and when I say that, people's heads go up and down, but they often act as though they do know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen, and therefore any sense that this is, this is how the long run is going to play out is a very tenuous one that could have all sorts of permutations with the passage of time. Um, I mean, I could elaborate on this thought, but I'll, I'll keep moving ahead. Therefore, I said to lock oneself into a position for an extended period of time is a mistake. Uh, that there has to be more flexibility about it and uh, uh, willingness to change maybe in the shorter run 
uh, instead of just sitting with a particular asset allocation and saying this is where I want to be. Uh, when you shake that down and you get to the bottom of it, there are two dirty words in there, market timing. If you're going to change asset, asset allocation in a shorter run than you have been doing, you are, quotes, market timing, and that's a very naughty thing to do because people don't do it well and it's very hard. And I have several answers on this score because I think that's a very, very important, very important issue about what we mean when we say market timing and that it's a naughty thing to do because it's so hard and nobody can do it well. Um, and I'm, I'm going to make a big concession to the other side, but otherwise I stick by everything that I said. Um, the, David rebalances his portfolio. Is it every day, Charlie, or uh, certainly over and over again? And he is very proud that they do that regularly. This is a, a, a ho holy kind of a a prayer every day that uh, the market is down, they buy, and if the market is up, they sell, and they, so they keep their ratio constant. And I said to him, you're timing the market. You're doing market timing. He said, no, no, we're just rebalancing. And I said, I think this is a matter of dif difference of opinion in, in words, not in substance. Because if you buy when the market goes down, you must believe that the market is going to go up again. And if that isn't market timing, I don't know what market timing is, and vice versa. So um, Yale is not as pure as David and Charlie would like you to think. The, the, the play, because they adhere to the policy portfolio, it, prevents, it presents a structure for market timing that they think is a very naughty thing to do, but they are actually doing it. The other problem is, is the, the deeper problem is I say that we do not know what the future holds and that therefore you have to be alert to changes and continuously testing the, the assumptions on which you've constructed the policy portfolio. It isn't something that every 18 months and two years the investment committee sits down and says, how do we feel about the policy portfolio? I think it's a matter you almost have to think of every day. Yes, I, as I say, if the system is going to survive, equities are the place to be because you can't get there in the long run with a, with a fixed income portfolio. But, um, and you can stand the shorter term fluctuations if you really have your, your vision out in the longer distance. But there are risks of major magnitude that you have to think about. Larry Siegel in an article relating some of this in the journal portfolio some years back said that the risk in the stock market isn't that it will fluctuate and that there will be volatility. We know how to live with that. The risk is that returns could be just catastrophic. And that risk is there. I mean, it's not a big risk, but the, the issue is what, what matters. And if you are wrong by blindly going on without thinking about what could happen in the long run, and how can I hedge that possibility of what could happen in the long run, I think you're doing a bad job of managing your money. So um, I, what I was asking for, in essence, was more flexibility about this thing, less rigidity, less devotion to a single-minded issue, and a deeper understanding about what it is that you're doing anyway, because we, we do tend to, if, if we're rebalancing, which I think is a great idea, um, if we're rebalancing, we are doing market timing. Now, I really wing this, so uh, I expect maybe more questions will get me to say more things about it, but that's my case. Charlie, to the extent that you really were this influence in driving David to write a book that is probably the cause of your international travelers asking you know, why they can do what Yale does, if you put on your Yale trustee hat, and say, now the world is chasing a structure that Yale had, I feel, a very strong competitive advantage when I worked there because other people weren't doing it. How do you think about how to position Yale uh, going forward now that this structure, this competitive advantage outside of a first mover advantage is, is um, disappearing as large pools of assets are crowding into the same trades? I thought I'd already covered that when I said that I think David Swenson has the worst, toughest, most difficult job in the investment profession. Do it again, David. It's the easiest sentence I've ever said in my life. 
all the really powerful portfolio structural ideas are now in the marketplace and been worked out. Uh, I don't know anybody who thinks they've got a really major strategic concept that would be an enduring comparative advantage for long-term investing. That's hard. Every market seems to be at least fully priced. So it's certainly not an exciting time in the broad sweep of things. It makes it hard. The amount of genius that's piling into the investment management profession is simply spectacular. And, um, you, those of you who are not in your ancient years might not realize the historical perspective, but I can give it to you very quickly. You know, up until 1969 at the Harvard Business School, there was a course on investment management. It was taught by a very distinguished elderly professor who took as his case materials the personal trust department of a regional bank located in Boston and a Miss Hilda Heald who had various personal financial needs from time to time and engaged in correspondence with her trust officer and that was the case material. The course went from 11.30 to 1 o'clock and as you would imagine, it was called by the students by its appropriate name, Darkness at Noon. <laughs> no. Nobody went into the investment management business when I graduated from business school. There were two guys that were at the very bottom of the class who went into the trust business, but they didn't go into the investment business. Uh, there's been some changes made. And I think all of us should be aware of the fact that there's a lot of really smart cookies who've gotten into the investment management business, and when you go out every day to compete with those really smart cookies, they're ready. You know, I was intrigued to find out that not only has the volume of trading multiplied a thousandfold since I first arrived in New York City, you know, solemnly intent on serving the long-term economic interests of the Rockefeller family, <laughs> as though they needed to help. Uh, but I did need a job, so we got along fine. Uh, <laughs> derivatives are larger in dollar value than the cash market. So a thousand times in the cash market and then derivatives multiply it by whatever number you want to. Uh, what intrigues me is I've been, in the last two weeks, in Copenhagen, which I think most of us think of as a lovely tourist center, but don't realize it's a hotbed of ferociously talented people who are dead set on trying to do better than any of the rest of us. Then I spent some time in Singapore where the government agencies, cheerfully known as the GIC, one of the most powerful aggregations of talent and relationships I've ever seen anywhere, bangs away through the computer system of the world in their competitive effort. It dropped down to Australia where the government has almost paid off all of its debt and then people said, wait, wait, don't pay off all the debt. We need to have it for a market indicator, so please keep some debt out. So they're now accumulating money at a very, very rapid rate in special purpose funds of various kinds. And then went over to see the government of New Zealand and they're doing the same thing. And in each of these clusters, not only do they have a significant amount of money, and I know sovereign wealth funds are popping up here, there, and another place, and they're going to keep coming at a ferocious clip. All of them know how to get in touch with the investment management community's leading search firms. And all of them know how to pay higher prices. And all of them want to have the very, very best team. And so I think you can anticipate that the quality of competition is going to get better and better and better. It makes it awfully damn hard to figure out where could you go to get a competitive advantage. And if you really wanted to be outrageous, what you'd be looking for is an unfair competitive advantage. That is, the other guy would say it was unfair. I'll be damned if I know. And if you look at the Yale Investments activities or any of the other leading activities, you say, it's really interesting. Those are all investment organizations that I've never heard of before. And that's one part of the effort to reach comparative advantage. And I realize that you've got a parochial interest in this particular kind of capability. You know, but you get really smart people looking for the most recently started really smart groups so that the investment assets can go that way. Isn't it pretty close to Game over, and where are you going to find a way to do something that other people haven't also discovered? P. 
Peter, you should answer that question. Yes, I should. Uh, <laughs> I should. Uh, just uh, to touch my own experience on, on something that Charlie mentioned, um, I graduated from college in 1940, and I didn't go into the investment business for another 10 years. When I was dragged in screaming and crying, my family dragged me in. I didn't want to be a social worker to the rich. But uh, I, the first day I got there, I was hooked, and we're still here. But um, at that moment, this was 1951, there were three members of my college class in Wall Street, and that's all. All three of us were the sons of fathers who had been there. One was named J.P. Morgan III, so there were really only two of us who had any choice at all, and, and there we were. Uh, but it was interesting because without ever having heard of efficient market or, or so on and so forth, I, we, I think we did beat the market, and I don't think it was th that hard in those days because there were not enough people who thought professionally. It was entirely different from what, what life is like today. Um, some up, had another thought on this, but it got, got away from me. Uh, but I think what, what uh, oh, the Yale portfolio and the alternatives bit, of which many of you here are a part, um, and should other people follow this lead? Um, I, I was, was and still am in principle very enthusiastic about this, this movement uh, because there is no, most uh, portfolios were carrying much more kind of liquid assets than they had to carry in view of their long run mission. And you get paid a premium for illiquidity and you get a premium for doing something that other people have not done. You get a premium for converting real estate into just buying stuff into making it a real investment medium. So th there was an enormous opportunity here that made good sense and in a general sense continues to make be, be, be wise. But what bothers me about it, particularly as this has grown, um, is that there is a built-in risk that we don't think about very much that relates to liquidity, the ir irreversibility of many of these decisions. And you reach a moment like the present when uh, we, we all feel a deep, deeper sense of unease in our gut than we did maybe two or three years ago because things are happening in the system that uh, we're unfamiliar with and haven't happened in this way before. And suppose, uh, incidentally, in, in our letter, the, our next issue was written by Ted about some of the risks that people are not thinking about out there that are very scary. Uh, if the stock market is a consequence of this, or the bond market too, is going to take a, a real header and present an enormous buying opportunity, but our policy portfolio says X amount in, in the alternatives. Um, are we going to be able to take advantage of that? Because it would be nicer just to own stocks and all this alternative stuff, which takes so much monitoring and care and, and, um, it, and difficulty of execution. Um, are, are, are we locked into this stuff and, and can't take advantage of other kinds of opportunities? I think this is a serious matter to think about when looking at policy portfolios and how much is devoted to the alternatives. They have huge attractions that stand alone, but they may not have as much attraction in a more volatile world than they have had in the world in which, in which they have grown. So I think this is a, a question to put forward and think about that great as they are, and, and a lot of you are, are providing this service, great as they are, do they, should they in this kind of environment occupy as large a portion of the portfolio as they do now? We see more and more institutions going more and more heavily into the alternatives for reasons that stand alone are good and sufficient reasons, but they may not be appropriate in a different kind of environment. And they may not be appropriate in the current environment either. Well, that's what, the current yeah. environment, different kind of environment. Peter, if, if one of us is sitting on an investment committee, and as a premise, we agree that going forward, traditional asset class returns may not be as attractive as they were in the past, and we're nervous about the structure of a long-term policy portfolio, how do you start to think about executing with those premises to create something that might do better in a different environment going forward? I was afraid you would ask me that. 
Oh, I can help but, you on that. I'll, okay. give you, I'll give you 30 seconds so you can give a really good answer. Uh, <laughs> it's just astonishing to me that we will, here we are all over again, Ted. We're coming right back to, yeah, but let me, let me tell you, how can we beat the market? And how can we get a higher rate of return? And I think that's fine, but I, um, that two different analogies, one of which is appropriate, one of which is not. Um, two people, a man and a boy, are playing Frisbee in London in Green Park. And an Englishman comes along and sees them and watches and watches. And after a while, the Frisbee lands on the ground and it so, okay, he's not breaking up the game. He goes over to the father and says, um, Sir, may I ask you a question? Who's winning? <laughs> a totally inappropriate question to Frisbee. And the inappropriate alternative would be if we were to discuss personal sexual habits and who's having the most fun and the most satisfaction. Most of us are quite curious about that, but we don't do more than once in a while, maybe every five or ten years, browse through a magazine that surveys that says 83% of people are deeply satisfied and so on and so on. Uh, why do we give a damn? It doesn't make any difference compared to are you doing what really matters to you? And I would like to confess, I have Happily married, my, I'm happily married to the most interesting woman I've ever known by a long shot. And she is clearly the very best friend I've ever had. And I'm enormously indebted to her for her generosity of saying, what the hell, I've only got one life, so why not I waste it on you? Uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful privilege. So half a dozen years ago, I had after one of these wonderful conversations with Peter, I had made a commitment of about 80% of whatever I had into emerging markets. I said, they've got hell in a handbasket. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia. I think that's a wonderfully exciting group of people. They work very hard. They'll figure out some way, somehow, to make this all work out, and they'll be forgiven for their past sins. This looks like a hell of a great opportunity. And Linda asked me, kind of casually over dinner, and what are you investing in these days? I said, oh, God, you'll love it. I'm investing in the emerging markets. And she said something like, you mean all those funny countries with those funny companies that I never heard of before? And I said, well, that's one way of describing it. And she said, well, those, that, that savings that you're talking about, I really need to know I can count on that in the future, and it makes me uncomfortable. And I said, well, Sweetheart, equity investing at its very finest is always uncomfortable. That's a test that you're really doing the right thing long term. No, she said, I don't think you understand. I really don't feel comfortable. So I, being a sensible fellow, sold out of emerging markets investments and sidestepped one of the great runs of all time. Most of... <laughs> Most of my friends would say, you poor dumb son of a bitch, you really screwed up on that. And I say, yeah, I know how you feel about it, but actually you might consider the possibility. I'm still very happily married to the same woman. And that's my priority. And I think it would do us all a lot of good instead of tinkering around with could we beat the market or could we keep up with Sam or Joe or Alice. It would be a wonderful thing if we said, are we doing what really serves the purposes that we care the most about for our particular investor or our investments or our beloved institution? Then in most cases, there's a terrible disconnect between what's being done and what is really needed. It's not that it's dead wrong, it's just there's a disconnect and there could be really great communication. And, um, I think the quality of communication is inadequate to the task, but it's not all that hard to change. Speak up. I mean, I can only hear, absolutely. I think we give this lip service, what Charlie just said, but are not, not very attached to it in practice because peer pressure is so great that if you don't look like Yale, you know, you're some, some kind of a schlump. You haven't heard what's going on in the world but maybe Yale is, is not appropriate for you. Um, it's very hard to, to do these things and very hard to stay with them. Um, way, way back in the late 1960s, um, we had a, a, a broker I knew, who was very, for, especially for a broker, a very thoughtful man, came and he said, I want to do something with my investment committee 
And I'd like you to come along and kind of give it your, your blessing, because maybe they'll go along with it. Uh, this was late 1960s. He said this was a charity. And he said our endowment fund is very small, relative to one year's budget. It's really just a drop in the bucket. Thank you. And I think we should go out and shoot the moon with it, because if we lose it, we're not really going to, I mean, everybody's going to be mad and sorry and screaming, but it's not really going to make any difference. Whereas if we can be, shoot the moon with it and really get someplace, it can make an enormous difference. So this appealed to me very much, and I went to the investment committee with him, and we saw the idea. That was in 1968 and 1969. Fully recognizing that this was a, a, a foamy period, but nevertheless, let's get started. And the next year, 1970, the market went down, the investment committee met, said, this is the end of this, we can't stand it. But they were wrong. They didn't understand that the loss was not important uh, to the committee, to the fund as a whole, and they should be doing it. So these kinds of thoughts that we express don't necessarily mean that you have to be very conservative. You have to be very conservative in the kind of environment Charlie is talking about. Sometimes investors take too little risk and should be much, much more aggressive than they are. Uh, but because the, the peers are not taking those kinds of risks and you might be caught wrong and alone, they don't do it. Um, so I think it, it means facing up to all the realities and all the possibilities that might go with it and, and not, not worrying about what the peers are doing. Uh, we were just up in Evanston meeting with the people at Northwestern there, Will McLean, who leads very heavily in the pension fund area. And uh, he said, what I really want to talk about is the Yale portfolio, because this hangs like a shadow over everybody, and everybody feels awkward if they're not in the Yale portfolio. But he was interested in starting a discussion for reasons why maybe they shouldn't be. Not that he necessarily thought they shouldn't be, but he wanted that kind of a discussion. And maybe, Ted, when you say, how do you begin a discussion about how do you want to allocate, how, what kind of policy you want to have, you begin by saying, do we want to be like Yale, and if not, why not? Or if so, why so? Well, you might also wonder, is Yale like Yale? I mean, my belief is most people's view of Yale is very far separate from my view of Yale as an endowment, and that the misunderstandings are what are rampant. So, Charlie, before I release you guys to the hounds, I want to push on this one question, because like the great Swenson, you have an unbelievable ability of saying things that are almost incontrovertible. Um, that said, the, the premise of, or one of the premises of Peter's challenging piece from a few years ago is, if you are looking at an era where the market ain't going to get you there. So you're a pension fund with known liabilities. Start at the top. What, what do you need? And, you, and the committee believes that you just can't get there with the traditional allocation. How do you begin to, how, when you talk to people who have that view, and I'm sure some do, how do you begin to think about what do you do from here? Well, there's some pretty clear choices. Uh, the obvious, best, most decisive act is to pass the problem to your neighbor by raising the actuarial rate of return assumption. Uh, that takes care of it pretty quickly. The second is to go out and get some people who will promise rates of return that are comparable to what you would like to believe you're going to get. And that also can be done pretty quickly. You know. As a third choice is to be sure you know what reality is and start addressing reality as reality. How are you sure what reality is? Ah, oh, <laughs> I shouldn't have sat in the same room with you. <laughs> but you can make your best efforts at trying to get to it. I think, I think committees are really pretty good at smoking out dumb. And if they are carefully chosen and the climate within the committee is open for straight discussion. I think committees are pretty good at sorting out bad misunderstanding and reasonably good at getting to a inaccurate but roughly right central expectation. I, I, I'm, I'm okay on that. Charlie, Charlie, let me take recent experience in a perspective. Um, Goldilocks was, I uh, used it last past tense, but Goldilocks 
was kind of a fantastic environment in which all the pieces seemed to fit together. The globalization process, the technological process, the, the public policy process, um, they all kind of fitted together and so one had a sense that this was an environment that was probably low risk, that nothing bad was going to happen because it, it just seemed, the pieces seemed to fit so well. I think this was a valid case. And therefore, it was an excuse to take on higher levels of risk, each of us individually, because we were living through a low-risk low environment. So when you say, what's the reality? The reality is Goldilocks is a, is a wonderful and very solid environment in which the risks are low, so let's do, let, you know, let's, let's play some games here. In the, this process of everybody being willing to take on more risk, and we see it in the narrowing spreads in the, in the fixed income markets of what was actually going on. Um, the environment ceased to be low risk, but actually was building up a, a, a sequence of things where it was high risk, and then we run into what happened this summer. Uh, I, I don't, don't think reality is either, is that hard, is that easy to, to describe, or one has to recognize the Hegelian thing that um, each, each regime kind of leads to another one endogenously because people take advantage of whatever regime is and thereby change it. So we don't have stability of regimes. And this is, again, what worries me about the policy portfolio, which implies that regimes, either regimes don't matter or that uh, regimes are in place for a very long period of time, when in fact this endogenous process is always at work so that no regime is going to be in place long enough. So finding, finding reality is hard, because it's slippery, it's, it's dynamic. You bet. Questions? Yeah. Um, Ken, Charlie, Peter, if I had one question to ask, I'd be happy to waste it on this group, so I will ask. Uh, we, we go around talking to the, yes, the sovereign wealth funds, Charlie, and they ask about Yale, and our question asks about Yale, and somebody today will probably ask about, can you do what Yale does? Um, the observation is that it's a little dangerous because the governance and investment policy needs to be very strong to maintain that type of investment program. I'm not sure those organizations would be able to stay the course. They probably will get out of emerging markets right at the uh, inflection point. And as a corollary, aren't we in a world where we've gone from a shortage of capital 10, 15 years ago to an excess of capital? And it was the economic impact of the businesses and the sectors and policy on the part of the government that impacted in the shortage of capital world. Now we're in a world where there's excessive capital. It's the actions of the investment organization, these large pools of capital, which start to affect the market. So risk, Peter, the complexion of the way we think about risk, and the Hegelian example, you get, don't we now move into a different sort of paradigm in the way we think about our portfolio? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of what you just said, because I, I do think you really did say it correctly. Uh, I'm going to complain a little bit, I guess. I, when I follow you around talking to all those sovereign wealth funds that know you, respect your judgment, and they ask about Yale, I'm astonished at what they really have in mind. What they have in mind is the rate of return. They'd kind of be willing to do some of the work that goes into developing the structure of the portfolio, and they'd be willing to do some of the work that goes into selecting investment managers. But they have no idea how the work is actually done, and they're not anywhere near prepared to do it. i give you, for an example, the most important single characteristic of the successes that Yale has enjoyed, and I think it's a wonderful thing for the America and the world that Yale is having this very positive experience. But the most important factor is love. Uh, men don't say words like that casually, so let me say friendship. Uh, the number of individual people who are really smart as the Dickens and very well connected who would dearly love to be helpful to David Swenson and his team because of how they have benefited over the years from their communications back and forth with David. Simply astonishing. And it goes all the way up to the movie star ranks and all the way down to the beginners. Now, 
There are thousands of people who think very, very favorably of the idea, if I ever had a really good idea, I know where I would like to take it first. Not to get some economic advantage for themselves and not to do anything other than to say, thank you, David, for what you're doing. And to see if their idea is as, as good as they think it is. <laughs> Second thing that and, and I can't overemphasize how important the informal scuttlebutt network, it is simply spectacular how many times Yale has been able to avoid harm by someone saying, well, actually, in this particular instance, I wouldn't do it because one of the guys in that group just isn't up to your standards. Or the number of times that somebody said the integrity isn't quite as pure and perfect as you guys like to have it. Now, that access to subtle insight from truly knowledgeable people widely is simply spectacular. And it is a crucial part of the comparative advantage. Uh, in fact, I think it's more important than the structure of the portfolio, just to give you a feeling for it. And the second thing is how well the investment office at Yale has done at coordinating and integrating its work with the university. I'd like you just to imagine if you were the chief investment officer of endowment for a large university, and you had a view along these lines, what would you do? And I'll give you two choices. One is there's a class that has been raising money in the past with this long-term concept of we'll raise money at our 25th and we'll give it to Yale at our 50th. And during the 25th to 50th era, those 25 years, we're going to put the money in the hands of a real gunslinger who is right out there on the frontiers of danger all the time. But Jesus, if he ever catches it, he might be able to really make it sing and dance, and this could become significant money. In the event, bull market, unprecedented bull market, speculative IPO, a, an aggressive portfolio manager on the frontiers, the money took off like you wouldn't believe it. They had three years to go before reunion. And you think, looks like the market's awfully high and it really looks like it's high for tech stocks and it really, really looks like it's high for recently issued tech stocks cheapers. And you're the chief investment officer. Would you put on your hat and coat and go over to see the president of the university and sit down and say to him, I think we should sell out that portfolio. And would you advise him that why don't you give credit for their reunion three years from now, 10% a year for the last three years, but make on oh, this quid pro quo for selling out the portfolio now. Or a couple months later, would you have put on your hat and coat, because it's almost always winter in New Haven, would you put on your hat and coat and go over to see the president of the university and say, we have a very substantial success in venture capital investments. That success has been denominated by some IPOs. We have a considerable portfolio of restricted stock. We have about a billion dollars worth of restricted stock, and I think what we should do is go short against the box. It's not really a short against the box because we can't short the same stocks, but we could short comparable stocks. This would be the largest short position any investor has ever taken in any portfolio at any time. And if it goes wrong, it'll be really wrong, and it'll be your failure, Mr. President. But I think we ought to do it. And I just want to check with you and see, are you ready to go short a billion bucks on a group of stocks that everybody else says, this time it's different, this time it's going to shoot the moon, this time is really, really exciting. That's the kind of work that it takes to really integrate and fund with a client. And it's the kind of work that makes a wonderful, wonderful difference. And that work isn't part of the sovereign wealth funds that you're going and seeing, and it's not part of most of the thinking most people have when they look at the return and say, gee, that looks like a nice return. I'd like to have one of that too. Remember that wonderful movie where the woman is sitting in the diner and next to her is a budding actress, and the actress 
is talking with her friend and says, no, you can fake an orgasm. No, you can't. Yes, you can. I'll show you. And she proceeds to fake an orgasm of the most spectacular kind. And the elderly woman sitting at the next table says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of that going on, too. Okay, Peter, now let's get a serious answer to the question. <laughs> you took my breath away. Uh, I, I can't really add to what Charlie said. Uh, there is a, there is a, w one of the things I learned, I learned two things writing Against the Gods, my book about risk. Uh, that, uh, they're very simple, but I find very helpful, and Barbara and I use, use a lot. Um, one is, uh, when one of the Bernoullis wrote Leibniz, uh, he said, we know this is, I forgot, around 1600, we, we know how to, uh, maybe a little later than that, we know how to figure the odds of throwing a seven or an eight with dice, but we don't know how much longer a man, of, the life expectancy of a man of 20 is compared with a man of 60. So I'd like to take some pairs of men, 20 and 60, and see what happens and figure the probability, the, the life expectancies. And Leibniz wrote back and said, you know, that's kind of a good idea. Nature does have certain patterns that repeat but only for the most part, that no model has an R-square of a thousand. And uh, that you have to think, they, they ain't no sure things. The other one is Pascal, who was trying to figure out whether God is or God is not. And he figured, you, you can't answer this question. You can't wake up one day and say, it's, it's this way or that way. But you have a choice of living as though God is or God is not. And suppose I live as though God is, and so I live a life of virtue and abstinence and pass up some of the goodies. Uh, and then I die, and there is no God. So I was wrong to have been so abstinent, and so led such a careful life. But it wasn't so bad. Nothing awful happened. On the other hand, if I live a life of sin and lust, and I die, and there is a God, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> so, what, I mean, what, what uh, Pascal is really saying is that consequences are more important than probabilities. What, what happens if I'm wrong? Does it matter or doesn't it matter? In the case that I was telling of the charity, if they were wrong to go into that, the, the, try to shoot the moon at that point, it didn't really matter very much and they should have done it. But there are many other cases where if you're wrong, it's catastrophic and you shouldn't have done it. It's, it's a very useful sieve to put many decisions through it in life, and we use it a lot. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to listen to Two Living Legends. I had to chuckle when you mentioned Mr. Bernstein in 1951. There was a fourth guy that started his uh, career. It was a big Brooklyn Irish Catholic. It was my father, Jack McCarthy, who used to run Ward Adam. He had a pretty good career. Uh, two questions. One, um, they used, and the authors talked a lot about families, the cycle, a long time cycle. I was curious, as a taxable investor of a family, uh, with issues around spending and burn rate and taxes, could you talk a little bit about your notion of policy portfolio risks from a taxable investor point of view with some of the issues, as opposed to the endowment hat that you've worn? And then Charlie, specifically, I'm going to pick up Michael's point on some of the wealth funds, currencies. Uh, was there any discussion when you went around the world about the currency risk? We have 65% of the world's reserves in dollars, 24% euros, but that whole currency, dollar devaluation, is a huge thing facing right now. It's been a discussion about that. Yeah, the last question is somewhat easier to answer. There's a lot of discussion, and the consensus is broad and deep. Dollars going down. Uh, those of you who our foreign exchange experts will know that that's often an indication that most of the harm has already been done. Uh, those of you who are Democrats would think, I told you so. Those of you who are Republicans will have your own reservations. Uh, but there's a very broad sweep. The second thing, which I think is much more important, is the enthusiasm for learning about nations other than North America are rising rapidly, and the alternatives are showing up alternative markets to look at, and I believe that a share of mind is a terribly important pre-ante to share of pocket or share of wallet, and that we will see a diversification away from the U.S. capital markets by other pools of capital all over the world. If I can pick up on what Charlie said, 
Uh, the dollar thing, to me, is a, is a perfect case of Pascal's wager. Um, I don't know whether there's going to be a dollar crisis in which there's a run on the dollar, but I do know that if there is, that's the mother of all crises. And therefore, I think that it has to be hedged. Um, I'm not the kind of guy who recommends gold, but it, it, this kind of fits the thing. There, if there are big risks, even if they don't materialize, I, you guys, I don't have to tell you guys, have to be hedged. And I think that one has to be hedged. Um, the, because the consequences would be so enormous. Um, and the point that Charlie makes is an, is an important one, that we think about the situation with the dollar and it's being held by the central banks of all these countries who have it as reserves. Um, but there are zillions of dollars held by uh, investors who are not central banks, but just plain investors, and have no particular vested interest in keeping it stable or, or preventing a run from happening. Like the Chinese have a bear by the tail. They certainly don't want the dollar to go down the tube. But Mr. Ching Ching, who's an independent Chinese investor, could, could care less. Uh, and so it can happen, even though the, the, uh, the, the central banks don't start it, don't want it, and are scared of it, and the, it can still happen. Uh, I think when you look around at, at risks in the system, this is to me number one. I don't know if it's going to happen, and I can't in any way make a prediction, but I know that the necessary pieces are in place, and if it does happen, God help us. So that it, that's one that has to be hedged. I don't know what we really answered the question, but absolutely right on target. No, perfect answers, uh, Ted. You should know. That I'm going to have to walk in just a few minutes, so if you've got any hard questions you want to ask, please. This is a continuation of what you were talking about. So I'm going to tell a short story and then ask the question. Let's say an individual uh, had a million dollars and called his investment advisor. He says, I'm going away for five years, so I'll come back and you know how I did. He did that. He came back in five years, and he was so anxious when he got out of the land. He uh, got out the phone, and the operator said that would be $3 million for the next two years. <laughs> so let's assume you kind of believe that may be where we are. Let's also assume that you have U.S. denominated assets which are dedicated to use today or in the future, or use in the future or whatever form. Since the variation of what you may have to use those assets for to be so wide, what would you suggest as your strategy to uh, cope with that? I think all of us know that you just asked a much better question than the answer is going to be. A uh, million dollars has some particularity to it. Most people would find that that's a, enough so they could spend that within a reasonable time period. So I. I would take the assumption that it's not really long-term money that you're talking about, but well, next 10 years. Money, it's gonna, you have a yeah. You, you can't, I'm, I'm trying to simplify it so I might have a chance of answering. If you, if you insist on being realistic, I'm going to have a very hard time answering the question. One way of coming at it would be to say that which you intend to spend inside the United States, you could leave in one in that currency and match the liability, i.e. spending intentions with the asset. That which you think you're going to spend elsewhere, you should get out of U.S. dollars and into a diversified portfolio of currencies. Uh, and that which you think someone else is going to spend or it's going to be after your time frame should be out of dollars and into currency. So that's a, a, it's a very mixed bag answer to your question, but I'm trying to be useful to the character of the questions. I think I understood it. Well, part of our problem is you've got assets for current or future liabilities that are U.S. denominated and will always be U.S. At the same time, you have this concern. At the same time, what? Yeah, the, yeah, I, I, Peter will know more about this because he has been continuously studying economics for such a long period of time. But I think you can make as one assumption that the exchangeability of currencies will be high for a long, long time in the short run. Uh, and in the context of what I think is the consensus of understanding by smart people who are working on this question all the time. Uh, 
the answer would be to internationalize your portfolio as much as you can. Yes. I think we're in that kind of world. It's, it's not necessarily balancing risks, but uh, it's, it's going it, the expression one world is becoming increasingly true. Steve? Thanks, Ted. We're going we're to wrap this up. Uh, quick announcement. We've got um, the programming committee meeting here in this room immediately after Charlie and Peter leave. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to subscribe to Peter's newsletter. It's really very, very good. Next issue, Ted Sidus. And it will support the home team. Uh, for those of you who um, don't understand the seating, we're trying to work this out and to the best of our ability. Uh, just by way of um, rules of the road, members of record sit on the in inner ring. And where is Vaso? Vaso, raise your hand if you would. Vaso is um, in charge of the care and feeding of members. So if you would like to sit anywhere special, do let Vaso know or me know, and we'll put your name tag there. Other than that, um, I have really not much else to say. And it, what I do would like to say would be to thank Kevin O'Brien, who's sitting to my right. He has um, gone out there and spreading the good word that he hears in this room to all the colleges and pension funds in smaller towns across the country. We're very grateful for that. Kevin, would you like to say anything? We think it was just, just fantastic. Thank you, though. Yeah, thank, thank you. I agree. And thank you. Charlie, thank you. Although you're not here, Peter, once again, great job.